there's just one last concept that I want to address, and then hopefully we'll be having a guest speaker come in. I'll hold you in suspense on that one. So, uh, sunk cost. <coughs> sunk cost. So we talk about average cost, marginal cost, variable cost, total cost, fixed cost. We got all these costs. And this is a special type of cost, sunk cost. Question? I know this one. Oh, okay. Sunk cost. Um, and these are costs that you've already uh, paid for that you can't recover. So these are costs that have been paid in the past and are not recoverable. And so this kind of leads into a, a line of thinking that uh, people fall into that economists call the sunk cost fallacy. And it goes something like this. Um, I bought uh, tickets to the football game and it is uh, each of the tickets were a hundred dollars and now I have this opportunity to go uh, do uh, my daughter's play at school uh, but I got these football tickets and I don't want to waste the hundred dollars how many of you have said something like that where you paid for something and then you're like, well, I don't want to waste my $100 that I spent and not go to the football game. That's not clear thinking in terms of how you should evaluate the decision. So we kind of hang on to those costs, uh, maybe at an emotional level, but in reality, the decision about whether to go to my daughter's play, and let's just say the daughter's play is free, right? It's some sort of a, uh, uh, sixth grade deal or something, uh, and the football game had the $100 ticket price, but now the football game is actually free. Right? That's the way to think about it. Now, we can get into concessions and gas and travel expenses, you know, and there might be some little bit of money that way. But if you're not able to get those ticket prices back, uh, it is a sunk cost, and so now the decision should be, if we go back to our uh, utility function from last uh, week on what makes us happy, is where do I get the most happiness, uh, going to my daughter's play or going to the football game, right? And so forget about the uh, happiness per dollar business, right? So the happiness per dollar is out the window because both are free, even though the tickets were actually $100. And so we see this happening uh, even with business decisions is that companies are like, oh, we uh, built this new building, we have to use it somehow, right? Or something, it's just sitting, it's just sitting empty. And maybe they do need to do, try to think of ways to do it, but don't do it just because it's already uh, been paid for and we have to kind of make it look good like we're using it. Um, if it's not recoverable, it's not a marginal cost. And so the way some cost kind of plays in the key point to this is that they are not in the marginal cost. Since you can't recover the sunk cost, it is out of the marginal benefit slash marginal cost decision, the marginal decision-making process. So let's put that example here. Uh, paid $100 three months ago for the Chiefs tickets, or some sort of football tickets. are conflicted <coughs> because your daughter's and maybe for you guys your <laughs> sister's play or something but your daughter's play 
is the same day. And so the key point of this is the $100 ticket price is a sunk cost. Uh, assuming, you know, no resale. And then the, the, we would take into account the resale, by the way, too. Oh, I could get, maybe you could uh, unload the $100 ticket for 30 bucks or something, right? Because it's kind of last minute or something. Or it turns out the football team three months ago, you thought they were going to be Super Bowl champions and now they're big time losers. And so nobody's willing to pay 100 bucks for that ticket. And so maybe you can unload it for 20 or 30 bucks and then you're still back to the same thing of uh, having that feeling that you're wasting, you know, 80 bucks or 100 bucks. So. So uh, the ticket price is a sunk cost, and now the decision is marginal utility of the play versus the marginal utility of the football game. Because marginal cost is zero. If I, part of my utility function is not catching hell from my wife, uh, then I need to go to the play and not to the football game. That's part of what's in this decision, right? So whatever falls into that uh, happiness function, there's a lot of things other than purely just observing uh, your daughter's play. All right, so does anybody got any questions or comments there? Yes, yeah, so that's the word. Oh, this is my because, but I have a little sloppy here. Shorthand for because. Were you here that day when I told you guys that I invented that? Okay. Wish I would have patented it. I'd be so rich right now. Okay. All right. So, okay, so that's our sunk cost. All right, so that wraps up chapter 21. Um, chapter, uh, the special topic this term is on um, resources and resource exhaustion. So why are we, you know, turning to um, renewable versus non-renewable resources. Well, part of it could be from the environment. Part of it could be from the fear of running out. So special topic 11 is on resource exhaustion. So we can start off with kind of defining a renewable and non-renewable resource. Give me an example of a non-renewable resource. Yeah. Gas. Okay, so oil, if we kind of think about where gas comes from, kind of the root, uh, the root resource. Um, so we've got oil in the ground. Oil and coal. So you extract the oil and coal from the ground, and it takes another 20 million years to replenish it, right? So Non-renewable is kind of the idea that you can't uh, renew that very fast. So uh, oil and coal, resource <coughs> does not renew um, fast enough relative to its use. And I'll put maybe its use being marketability, right? So with these two things, <coughs> we'd be talking about uh, generating energy. OK, 
Okay, so then we've got renewable resources. So you guys know the routine. What's our re renewable resources? C give me a couple examples. Wind. Give me another one. Water, yes. Big glowing thing up in the sky. Solar, right? So sun. I mean, those are kind of the classic ones here. So that when we think about relative to oil and coal, uh, we have uh, solar, uh, water, and wind. Yeah, so pulling, yes, something that's heating from the ground, so geothermal, uh, the water is being heated down below. We got some hot water that we could use, and as long as the water isn't disappearing from the water table, then that's being heated, reheated. So a geothermal system brings, drills a uh, pipe way down deep, brings the hot water up, we use the energy, and then it goes back down, and, and so it's kind of this circular loop with geothermal energy. All right, so um, the point with renewables is that they do renew. So can be uh, renew fast enough for additional use. Okay, so that sounds too good to be true, right? So maybe some of you have uh, heard some other teachers in grade school and high school and, and uh, on TV that, you know, this is great. I mean, this is renewable. Uh, why would we, you know, still be using coal, oil and coal when those are gonna run out on us, right? So what's the catch? Why don't we just move into all renewables? Why do you think we don't just, I mean, isn't that kind of a no-brainer that if we can use the sun and the sun comes out every day or, or the wind is blowing, um, why aren't we just getting rid of oil and, and coal? What'd you say? It's cheaper. It's cheaper, right. So we bring in the cost factor into it. So there's two things actually, cost and scale, cost and scale are some of the reasons that we can't just adopt this other resource. There's also the nuclear aspect. Yeah, yes. Now, uh, once you use up the uranium though, it's gone. And you gotta send it into space or something. So that's kind of tricky to get rid of, but yes. And then you gotta, of course, the whole process of the nuclear plant. <laughs> All right, so uh, bu -bu -bu so let's put that question here. Why not adopt all renewables? And so I think you're right, Anthony. Number one on the list would probably be just the cost. <clears throat> and when we say cost, it's 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 costly to do it. And so then we look at a the marginal benefit, marginal cost of uh, not using something else uh, makes it uh, very expensive. So cost is one thing. So um, storage is difficult. And I never, until I did this podcast here recently with, um, I can't remember if we had, yeah, oh yeah, we had a special guest on. Uh, we had Levi Russell on. And I never really thought about this, but uh, one of the things that's unique about uh, oil and coal is that it stores really well. How do you store solar energy? What do you have to do? Batteries. So, well, and wind too, right? Any of those things, right? Because you're just, the problem with this energy source is that if the wind isn't blowing, we don't have it, right? If the sun isn't shining, we don't have it. And then to move to the next day then, to be able to have energy to use, we need to be able to store it. And then lithium is a very expensive uh, resource as well. And so even with the biggest batteries, we can't even come close to storing enough to really go, and this gets back into the scale, 
We can't store enough to do it. Uh, there was one research study that said uh, if Germany, to, in order for Germany to get up to, I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to make up some numbers, but let's just say 50% energy generated by wind, every square inch of Germany would have to be covered in wind, in wind uh, windmills, those big windmills, all the land, to, and they would only get up to like 50% if they did that. And so now you also face the trade-offs of, well, what does it mean to have a resource like land also to enjoy the land? I don't know about you, but looking out over a field of windmills, it's kind of cool when you see them the first time, but if there's mountains in the back, they're kind of distracting, right? If you're trying to enjoy nature and beauty, then we're kind of using up another resource of the views of the mountains and the landscape and, and other things that that land could be used for to have the windmill uh, there to bring in the power. So there's all these, uh, all these issues related to this. And so cost, storage is difficult. Um, let's just say harvesting is costly. So these are the windmills. And solar panels. The guest that we had on, Levi Russell, is, has a dashboard that um, I need to check in if he's got that done. It was kind of a project of his that showed like the per unit cost of windmills and solar versus oil and gas, and it's dramatic. It, it, some of these are like a dollar, and oil and gas is like 10 cents per unit of energy. So if you kind of put apples and apples, um, it's, it's expensive. <laughs> Okay, questions or comments there? So cost is one thing. Um, and then, you know, the, the uh, let's see, I guess I'll put this under cost. I was gonna maybe put it under the other one, but um, is environmental cost. Um, parentheses damage, if you want to call it that way. Is environmental cost worth the additional price of uh, non-renewables, or renewables, sorry. So that's where the debate really comes in is, um, how do we put a price tag on the environment? Well, we do some research and you know, some study comes out that we're, well, we're gonna raise global temperatures by uh, a degree 200 years from now. And so then, all right, so we've got people 200 years from now, we've got people today, um, you know, should we move this direction? Who does, if, if we did adopt policies that made energy much more expensive, who gets hurt the worst? in society the rich or the poor the poor we all got to stay warm we all so energy is one of those things with heating our houses and gasoline and getting to work and so that's another part of this that's uh difficult is that the poor get hit the hardest so note the poor get hit the hardest when uh, expensive energy is uh, forced on the market. My second bullet was just the scale of it. So number two is the scale. At this time, there is no way to meet the 
quantity demand of energy through renewables. So I'll just kind of put in general, you guys can Google this later if you want to, but in Germany, I won't put the percentages down just so you know, but basically you have to, even covering all the real estate with windmills, if Germany covered all of its land with windmills, it would only be a fraction of what is needed. So that's what we mean by scale. It's hard to, to get that. Now, as innovation and technology changes, you know, we start to be able to come up with new innovative ways to do it. And that could be a different way. The nuclear option seems to be, uh, I think, getting more and more support from both uh, sides of this uh, argument. But nuclear has kind of a bad history. So we've had a couple meltdowns, right? So Chernobyl, did anybody watch that? There's a video series called Chernobyl. Uh, Japan just had something happen with the nuclear plant. Um, but the again, there the technology has changed and there's a lot safer methods and so there's uh, definitely some innovation and movement to keep, uh, to keep it safer and, and to uh, maybe head that direction with low cost energy. Uh, the Wolf Power Plant, uh, Wolf Creek Power Plant here uh, is about 50 minutes away from Ottawa. And I, uh, my neighbor was a nuclear engineer there, and he told me when that thing is running at capacity, it powers all of Kansas City. All of Kansas City. One, one power plant over here, that's how powerful nuclear is. And then, but the problem is then when something comes up and they have to replace things and, and they're, you know, they're super cautious with maintaining, it'll be down for like 100 days while they're maintaining the plant, uh, changing up the uh, rods, the uranium rods or whatever, I don't know, all the technology. But it can be down for extended periods of time. But they are all hands on deck, like trying to get that plant up and running again uh, because that's how valuable it is in terms of the power it can generate. Okay, did I see your hand up? Yeah. Um, Ethan, right? Yeah. Uh, for like, being the enough energy for everyone, is that kind of like for like their businesses, but to make like some households just get their energy off of solar panels off the roof? Yes, yeah. So I'm, when I'm thinking scale here, I'm thinking of the whole country or whatever to get enough of the market. So, um, so yeah, your question if, you put solar panels on your roof, a lot of households are able to uh, generate enough for themselves, so they basically have zero bill. Now, that sounds good, but has anybody heard, maybe some of your parents put solar panels on, how much that costs to convert to solar? It's about 20,000 bucks. Yes, and if they get damaged. And there's one, uh, again, a story that Levi, he specializes in this stuff, but he said that they put up solar panels in a field and spent millions of dollars and then good old Kansas hailstorm came and just trashed them. And then worse yet, the chemicals and the shards of glass um, basically contaminated all the soil. And so it, was, it basically couldn't be used again for a different purpose after the solar panels were damaged. So all kinds of weird stuff like that can happen and, and uh, it, it can leave you scratching your head. Uh, on whether it's a, it's a good route to go. Um, and, and so I've done those analysis, by the way, and you'll see people say, you know, do solar, it's a great investment, and blah, blah, blah. Well, I've, I've ran the numbers on how much you're saving and kind of the rates of return, and it's not a very good rate of return at all. 
um, in terms of uh, even if you had solar without broken panels or anything for a long period of time, you're better off putting your money somewhere else in terms of investment. Now, that's where you get into the consumption part, right? So if somebody feels like they want to do their part to help the environment, then it's more turning into consumption rather than investment, right? They're giving up beer, pizza, and chicken wings and a, and a trip to the Caribbean to put solar on their house, and that makes them feel good. That's fine, right? Um, but in terms of the investment aspect of it, um, it doesn't, uh, doesn't quite pass the test. Okay, anything else there? Yeah, if it dries up, yeah, yeah, with the drought that they were having in uh, the West, and then things like Hoover Dam don't function as well as either. Um, so you guys have heard some of the alarming things with headlines, and so now we've kind of set the stage just to some of the basic issues here. Um, you know, do we face the possibility of running out of some resources and so do we have to cut back um, whether it's oil or whether it's uh, iron ore tin copper lead zinc all of these basic uh, resources <coughs> um, <clears throat> here is some of the predictions dating back to 1966 that um, I thought was kind of interesting to let you know uh, that the world coming to an end is not a new headline here in 2020. 1966, oil, gone. Famine, 1975. Natural resources, gone. 30 years from now, 1970, 2000. Now, were these real studies by real scientists? Yeah, you know, the media might have taken the headline and dramatized it a little bit, but there was some sort of research going on at that time uh, based on whatever assumptions they made and, and data that they gathered that this would happen. Uh, we're gonna have mass recovered by 1985. Decaying pollution will kill all the fish. Killer bees, ice age, new ice age, by 2020, whew, we're still safe right now, but uh, it says 2030, 1971, the year I was born, we got an ice age coming. There's more. Seventy-two, oil's gone again gotta shift to solar and wind or start changing our ways. Oil will peak in the 90s. Cooling trend, 1978. No end in sight for cooling trend. Acid rain. <clears throat> the Maldive Islands will be underwater. DC temperatures record highs. <clears throat> Peak oil to 2010, back in 2000. New York underwater by 2015. Got to take action now, right? So they come out. Why do we see headlines like this? What's their incentives? Yeah, Seth? To give people change. Yeah, to create kind of a sense of urgency. And so part of, um, <clears throat> uh, part of kind of a leadership quality, if you will, even for running your own business or other things, is to get people motivated to create a sense of urgency. Like we need to act now. So when we, when we say, because I have heard some recent studies, again, I don't know what a degree means, but you know, the, the, the overall temperature on the globe will rise 200 years from now. 
human nature is 200 years from now. Who cares? We'll figure it out by then, right? Or whatever, that's the thing. Well, if your incentive is to sell papers, you want to create a headline like this, right? If your profit is to sell papers, then you want this type of headline to create a sense of urgency. Who else would like to create a sense of urgency, do you think? Who else, people in their jobs or where they're at that would like to create a sense of urgency? Politicians. Politicians, good. So with the policies that they have, um, they're gonna take office, they're gonna be the one that kind of ushers in some new policies that gives them more power, more control over resources. If, they've, so, if the public's been sold on something that's gonna happen, fairly quickly, we gotta take action now. That's good for me, because I'm in office right now. I can make some instrumental policy changes to start spending uh, $100 billion on this, you know, Save Manhattan initiative or something, right? And so now I'm in control of the $100 billion putting it there. So those incentives that we learned in the political process from chapter six uh, start to kick in. All right. And then this is where we end down here. Just trying to see where the Al Gore is here. He was uh, running for president. Here we go. Yeah. So Al Gore was kind of uh, rising to the top as a, a climate uh, person. So climate genius Al Gore predicts ice-free Arctic by 2013. So the Arctic's at the North Pole. So. That was the prediction publicly put out there. So I was, uh, I don't know, let's see, 20, 2008. Yeah, I was still in Iowa. I mean, he was, you know, it would be like one of our presidential candidates coming out and saying stuff like that. So Al Gore was uh, vice president under uh, Clinton. And so it's a fairly high profile person is what I'm trying to say, coming out and, you know, making these um, uh, statements and predictions using charts he had you know, fancy charts that are showing that, you know, this is this is what they predict. And so, yeah, we're just not, uh, not there. And we haven't seen any of that come true. So part of what uh, chapter uh, 11, the special topic, is going to kind of bring you through some of that. And... Here's another... Thing from it. I don't want to steal uh, my guest time. He should be here probably towards the end. Get that in there. Okay. So this is something about the world reserves. Um, so proved reserves uh, is something about the amount that they know they can extract from the ground now is the amount of reserves of tin, copper, iron, or lead, zinc. And so in 1950, there was the level of reserves. And so you'd think we're producing between 1950 and 2011, and the 10, 000, or the 2,000 reserves were 10 reserves here in 2019, but iron ore, way higher. So we're seeing things go actually up. Come on up, Peter. Just perfect timing here. I was just uh, showing them this one last thing. All right, so I'm happy to have Dr. Jacobson uh, explain this a little bit more. So there's um, some interesting stuff. So what I've done, Peter, is uh, they've got a little bit of background on renewables and non-renewables, just kind of the basics, and uh, that the, some of the costs associated with harvesting. And then uh, I was just touching in on the amount of reserves, but I haven't really gotten into anything uh, of course, with the Simon stuff. So, Peter is our other economist with the Gortney Institute, and here on campus, some of you might have him for, he's been teaching management in some other classes. Uh, so, you know, he is uh, what I would call an expert on Julian Simon, who had some really amazing contributions. Uh, his name is mentioned in this chapter as well, so I thought it'd be cool if Peter could come and talk to you guys about it. Okay. Well, thanks, Russ. Uh, good to see everyone. So, as Russ said, my name is Peter Jacobson. Uh, yeah, I, I, I got interested in this topic because like a lot of you all probably, uh, when I was, and maybe some of you haven't thought about this, but when I was in high school, uh, I kind of took the general view, which I think most people take that we have too many people in the world, that the world is overpopulated. Uh, and if you will go and ask 
people on the street, that's what most people would say. Uh, and so I started uh, reading into this, and what I found surprised me. Uh, there was an economist named Julian Simon who uh, passed away very young. Uh, and he, he died in the late 90s, and so that's the time frame of, uh, he was in his 60s then, so he did most of his writing in the 80s, the 70s and the 80s. And he wrote this book called The Ultimate Resource. And uh, in that book, what he does is he talks to some of the thinkers at the time that were arguing the world was over, overpopulated. And so there was a famous ecologist, actually he's still living, named Paul Ehrlich, uh, and Ehrlich was really concerned that uh, we were going to run out of resources. And specifically in the 70s, he thought we were going to run out of food. And so he made all these predictions. Uh, for example, he predicted that uh, there wouldn't be enough food in the United Kingdom, the country of Britain, uh, for there to be food by the year 2000, or for there to be people by the year 2000. Uh, and he made other predictions along this line that there would be billions of starvation deaths in India because of their overpopulation and all this. Uh, and it turned out Ehrlich was wrong. Like, none of those predictions came true. Uh, we didn't run out of food, nor did we run out of uh, metals. Uh, we didn't run out of oil or coal or anything like that either, like was predicted. Uh, the basic reason that he was wrong is because uh, the underlying logic that the world can be overpopulated is wrong. Uh, the world can't be overpopulated. The concept doesn't even make any sense. And Simon wrote on this, and he wrote on this at a time where it was very unpopular to write on this. And so, uh, to give you an example, Ehrlich was on the Johnny Carson show. Uh, if you follow like American media at all, you know Johnny Carson may be the most influential talk show host, late night talk show host of all time. He kind of created that format. It's now like Conan and you know uh, Stewart and all these guys who do late night talk shows. They all model after Carson. And so Ehrlich's idea is that we were going to run out of stuff and the world was very overpopulated. Uh, <coughs> They were very popular, and most scientists agreed with them, uh, most economists agreed with them. Uh, it was a pretty universal uh, belief. But Simon disagreed. He disagreed because he read a paper by a woman by the name of Esther Bosero about how a small group in Africa, when they were able to grow their population large enough, they were able to implement technologies that they already knew about, but they couldn't use without a larger population. And this was a kind of like an aha moment to Simon that it might be the case that certain technological advancements are only possible when you have a certain number of people. In other words, uh, you have to have more people in order to advance technologically to a certain level. And so Simon uh, puts, put this to the test. And so you've got like little graphics there of uh, Julian Simon and Paul Ehrlich. Uh, Simon asked, like, what would we expect to see in the real world if we were running out of resources? Like, what would we expect to happen? Uh, you all are in an econ class. Uh, what would you expect to happen if we started running out of, I don't know, uh, if a store in town started running out of those uh, Stanley water bottles that everybody likes right now? What's going to happen to the Stanley water bottles? Please answer his question so it looks like you guys learned something, especially after this. So the decrease in supply, what? Yeah, so a decrease in supply means there's going to be an increase in price. There you go, CJ, extra credit. Yeah, so, so CJ got it exactly right. You expect a decrease in price. And so here's what Simon said. It's like, let's look at the price of a group of metals over 10 years. And he let Ehrlich pick the metals. He said, you can pick whatever metals you want. And metals are a classic non-renewable resource, right? We don't create more iron or copper or whatever. That, that's not how it works. Um, I guess we can create some kinds of metal, but uh, the raw metals, you can't create more. They're just in the crust of the earth. And so Simon's argument is if, if, they were, if those things are running out, then we should expect the price to go up. And so Ehrlich agreed to this bet. They bet on 10 metals, I believe, over the course of 10 years. And lo and behold, the price of those metals over 10 years decreased, which is the opposite of what you would expect if they were running out. And so Simon's argument uh, is that it's too simple to think about things like metal and oil just being things that are in the ground that we have to pull out. And uh, you know they're basically already there and we just have to grab them and we use them up. Simon had this great quote that oil doesn't really come out of the earth, it really comes out of the human mind, right? A thousand years ago, if somebody discovered oil, they would have been annoyed by it. It would have gotten them all dirty. Uh, there would have been no benefit to it. It wasn't until the human mind created a uh, use for oil that it became valuable. And so Simon's point is that human innovation outruns the problems that humans create. In other words, people do bring them out to think with them, uh, but they also bring hands and brains uh, that can create more resources. And you see this with like advanced recycling. You see this with if we ever get nuclear power to a really successful level where it's not dangerous and it uh, on net is uh, beneficial, the nuclear power has the potential at least to produce more energy than we could ever use as a species over thousands of years. And so Simon's point is that uh, people aren't just consumers, they're producers. 
Uh, and in fact, if you look over the whole human history, it has to be the case that there are more producers than consumers. Otherwise, we would be in a worse state than when we started. If we mostly consumed resources, uh, we wouldn't have all this advanced technology. On the flip side of things, well, what's true is we actually mostly produce resources. We have more food than we've ever had. We have access to more metals than we've ever had. We use more energy than we ever have before. And that's a result of humanity. It's not in spite of humanity. So that was uh, Simon in a nutshell. I guess is if there's anything else you want me to talk about. And the actual bet was a thousand bucks. Yeah. Yeah. Paul Ehrlich did concede the bet. He wrote Simon the check. So there's a picture of the check you can find out there. Uh, yeah. What's maybe more amazing is um, was it just last year? Within the last two years, Paul Ehrlich. Uh, the guy who was the ecologist contesting this, all of a sudden I saw him on a CBS uh, show, the nightly news, and the whole 10 minute, 15 minute piece, and he was basically making the same arguments that he did when he lost the bet back in the 70s. I don't know if you want to comment on that, I can't remember all the details, but, but he basically said, uh, you wrote a piece on it, I think. Right? Yeah, I, I mean, you all know like what sells in media, what doesn't, right? Like bad news sells, and good news doesn't. People don't click onto articles that say everything's gonna be fine, people click on articles that say everything's gonna be bad. And so there's a weird incentive, uh, both in our sciences and in our media, to focus on doom and gloom, because that's what interests people. And so, uh, regardless of what the facts in the world say, there is always gonna be a market for people to be afraid of things. Uh, so, these ideas persist, uh, there's a lot of money for people who research uh, more doom and gloom things not a lot of money for people who research and find like actually it's going to be okay. So uh, yeah, Ehrlich uh, continues to say, Ehrlich's response to this whole thing and why he lost the bet and why his predictions didn't come true is the, the, he says the only reason that happened is because of something called the Green Revolution, which is something that happened in agriculture uh, that made our farming more efficient. And so that's why we didn't run out of food and all that. But of course, this that was Simon's entire point is that human minds are able to create these things like the Green Revolution that approve things. Uh, so he could say that, well, if not for that, things would have gone badly, but of course that's the whole point, is that things like that do happen. So we're, we're just kind of touching in on business and cost. So as the price of these resources start to rise, like you know he predicted and he said it, that it wouldn't go, as price starts to rise, what happens to the profitability of trying to figure out solutions for that? Does it go up or down as the price of this stuff rises? What happens to the profitability of finding a new way to do it? It goes up, right? And so that's the whole discovery process and innovation and technology. The market actually working that it's signaling that, oh, this, this resource is becoming more scarce, which makes it all of a sudden more profitable to try to figure out solutions on how to deliver that. And so that's always this continual process. Um, Peter, you're, talk about your book. I, I, it's kind of tied into some of this, right? So Peter's writing a book. I think you're getting close to being finished, right? It's 60 percent Okay, so we're, we're going to celebrate his book in the future, but give, give these guys, I think that's kind of a nice tie-in uh, with some of this stuff as well. Yeah, so the book is all about how basically as humans we've created three different ways to decide who, who gets what resources through. Because we are scarce resources, right? We have at a, at a given time there are some limited amounts of things that we have, and there's an unlimited amount of wants, right? People always want more. And so there's three different ways to allocate resources. One is through market processes, and so businesses and consumers buying and selling. Another is through government. Government allocates resources, so that's laws, bills, rules, regulations. And then the third is through nonprofits. Uh, so nonprofit organizations will often allocate resources. They don't buy and sell to make a profit, but they're also not governments. They don't make laws. <laughs> so these are three ways, and we generally think about, uh, if we think about how nice these things are, like what the, the prettiest of all of these organizations are, most of us probably think of like nonprofits as being the best. Uh, that we think of like these nonprofits to save the whales and help the environment or whatever. Uh, these, these are things that we generally think of as good. And that, for the record, I do like nonprofits to a certain extent, but we tend to rate that the highest. Below that, there's a little bit of a competition of, you know, some people think uh, government's the next best, some people think business is the next best, best, but most people don't like, for example, like really big corporations, right? Like generally, the, if you talk about a really big corporation, that tends to have a negative connotation. And so what I do in the book is I look at these three different types of allocation, and I try to argue that if you're like a young person who wants to save the world or help the world or something like that, 
that actually historically and also logically the most uh, apt institution to do that is business. Uh, if you look at where most of the resource allocation is the most successful, it's uh, companies like Walmart. A lot of people don't like Walmart, uh, but Walmart has also provided low cost food to more people than any organization in history. Uh, on the flip side, you know, the government and nonprofit both have uh, features that make them not quite as apt to deal with things. And so uh, profit's really valuable because it tells you if your customers value something more than the resources you put in. And so it tells you if you're creating value or not. If you're a nonprofit, you actually don't get to use profit to make that measurement. So you have to use other ways of measuring things. That's one uh, difficulty with nonprofit. Another difficulty with nonprofit is the people who receive your goods aren't the same as the people who buy your goods. In other words, they're not the same as the people who give you money. So if you're a nonprofit helping disaster victims, for example, the people who receive the goods you provide are you know, the people who are the victims of the disaster. But the people who pay you for it are actually donors, right? And so this causes some issues where uh, donors don't have the same incentive to check on their money as the buyer of like a phone does, right? Or the buyer of a car. How much time do you put in when you're researching buying a new car? Probably actually like a decent amount, right? You make sure you've got a reputable dealer, you look at the mileage, you look at the Kelly Blue Book. Uh, but if you are a donor of a large charity, uh, you actually don't see the end product. And so there's an incentive to uh, pay less attention. Raise your hands if you've ever donated to charity before. Raise your hand if you've ever spent more than an hour researching where your money went. <laughs> so very few, right? There, there might be some, but very few. Uh, and what that shows is the incentives in nonprofits, though, again, nonprofits aren't bad, but the incentives of them aren't structured the same way as when you buy a house, all of you are gonna spend lots and lots of time researching your house. You're gonna spend lots of money and lots of hours making sure the house is a good investment. And so the incentives are lined up in for profit in a way that they, they aren't a nonprofit. Uh, government uh, has some advantages. It can do things on a large scale that maybe a private organization can't, but it also has disadvantages. Again, think about voting. Uh, there's always those like funny man on the street videos out there about people who don't know who like the vice president of the country is, or they don't know their state's representatives, or you know they can't name the three branches of government, all those questions. Uh, the same people who don't know those, the answer to those questions uh, decide who our leaders are. And so this, again, is a really weird system where because you don't personally impact the result completely by yourself, your vote's very unlikely to make a real difference in an election, in other words. There's just really low incentive to research, and so this causes like issues. And so that's the main idea of the book, is that we need to rethink uh, what the best way of doing good is in the world. It's not saying that government nonprofits can't do good, but it's that we need to have a little bit more appreciation for forms of uh, organization, forms of resource allocation, which align knowledge and incentives to help people like business, for example. All right, we just got another minute left. Any last questions for Peter or Connor? All right, we'll call it a day. Thank you, Peter. Yeah.